Hello, I am Aziz Hanifa and welcome to another episode of The Trailblazers. Today, our guest Chandrika Tandon, businesswoman, philanthropist, Grammy nominated musician, patron and connoisseur of the arts and a major participant particularly in STEM education. Chennai born Tandon is today an amazing role model to not only Indian American and South Asian American women and girls but to all American women on how to shatter glass ceilings with grit and determination coupled with an unassuming philosophical perspective. Chandrika, it's a delight to see you again and thank you for inviting us to your lovely home. Thank you so much, Aziz. Apart from your business success, uh, you are a humanitarian, a Grammy-nominated artist, and also your life uh, in general. How has this journey, how has this journey of yours informed what you are doing right now? Because the first phase of my life was very intensively in the business world. Yeah. You know, even though I did so much music, I sang before I could speak, so to speak, yeah. and I spent so much, you know, of my happy times with music, but then yeah. I gave it up. Yeah. And I went very much into the business yeah. world. But then, uh, about 20 years ago, I started to go back to seeing what is what makes me happy because business is fundamentally unidimensional. Yes. You get, you know, if you're a great CEO or people aren't terribly interested in your musical talents yes. or your dance yeah. talents, yeah. they just want to know what have you done for the stock yeah, price or what have you done to my investments. Yeah. Yeah. That is what you yeah. get rewarded for. Yes. And rightly so, because yeah. we also worry when someone says, oh, I have these 20 interests, you yeah. say, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Are you going to spend enough time on my company? Yeah. You know? So I think all of us have this issue. When we've hired people, we look at the same question. Yeah. But that was my life. Yeah. 20 years ago, I started to say, what made me happy? And I went back to music in a very intensive way. And I didn't go back to music because I wanted to sing and perform and all of that. I went back to music because I wanted to find myself and find my deepest source of happiness. Now that music, the way Indian music works, starts to take you into the space of meditation, starts to take you into a very um, conscious process of quieting the mind because you really can't be a very good singer if you've got so many thoughts coming and running in between. Yeah. Now, as I started to quiet my mind and, and the music led me to this whole path of, of finding my best self really, part of that is I said, I really want to do good. I want to spend a good proportion of my life serving. In fact, I made two promises at that time. One is I actually went to NYU, the university I had never been to, and I went to the dean of the business school and said, I would just like to do something to her, serve. Just out of the blues. You out of the yeah, blue. And, but yeah. the universe is very yeah. synchronous. Again, yeah. because somebody, I was thinking I made a great attention that I wanted to do this. Yeah. or Just use my business skills yeah. in a non-profit, in a without any reward yeah. where there were, and I, and it just happened. Somebody yeah. introduced me and the yeah. next thing I knew, I was spending a huge amount of time at NYU. Yeah. So, and then the second promise I made is that every day I would try to do something good that doesn't matter. It could be writing a letter on behalf of someone. It could yes. be helping someone cross the road, yeah. something small and big. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be big gestures. Yes. But on the other hand, I had to use whatever resources I had to help. So I made this almost the, the prism with which I viewed my life. Yeah, yeah. So it, and that changed my entire being. So that's how I started. So to NYU, it didn't start out just uh, with spending two hours a week, which yeah. is what the dean wanted me to do. Yeah. Next thing I was spending three days a week, I was teaching classes and this is going back to 2000. Uh, I was yeah. teaching classes. I, uh, I was, you know, doing leadership lectures. I led his strategy teams for global strategy, domestic strategy. I was living in the school. I was with faculty. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing yeah. is as these three dimensions come together, I was able to apply, and I still am able to apply, the best of this business training I've had and yeah. I continue to have yeah. with McKinsey and all these other firms yeah. in the world of philanthropy or in the world of nonprofits or yeah. in the world of education. Yeah. So, and the music side yeah. is the side that as I say, everything else is what I do, music is what I am. Yeah. And talking about doing good, uh, you have been a champion for women in the workplace and not only wanting them to, uh, you know, rise through the ranks, but also see them reach their sort of full potential. 
in your opinion what does it take to support women and for them to have fulfilling careers and personal lives too at the same time you know i think this topic of women is something um very very dear to my heart and and look there's just been a lot written about breaking the glass ceiling yes, and yeah. equality so, and gender cliches, yeah, and i yeah. i really don't want to deal with that i yeah. mean there's enough policy issues happening there's enough people talking about creating communities for women and there's yeah. a lot of talk happening yeah. that's a whole that's a whole important area yeah. that we need to address i don't want to to reduce the importance yeah. of it but there are a lot of people much better qualified than yeah. me doing this but i feel there's a there's some one aspect of it which i'm very worried about and for me it was a uh, it really took me into a very dark place yeah. um i think it's a broad generalization yeah. so forgive me for that but i think we as women because we are caring we are compassionate physiologically biologically we are constructed a certain way we are also the people that do well in the business world or in any field we all pride ourselves we wear the badge of being perfectionists with great honor yeah. and i certainly was one of those and even now i yeah. i every I, 80% of the women i meet will tell you this yeah. and there's this tape recorder that keeps playing in your head yeah. that i'm not good enough so you are trying to and very often all of us have competed in men's worlds i mean yeah. when i went to college there were four women in my class and and when i went to i am amdabad there were eight women in my class I mean so and these were and the same way at McKinsey there were hardly any yeah. women because and so and a lot of women that are in good positions and I don't mean just the top top positions yeah. but even in the middle positions yeah. they have overcome more challenging odds yes. than their male counterparts Absolutely. for a variety of reasons yes. nobody's had it handed to them easy yes. what that does is psychologically it creates a whole set of patterns you try harder you kind of beat yourself up more and you have this entire conversation that's happening in your head all the time which actually interferes in your being your best self yes. because and then you start to think about um microaggressions in a very different way because you know i you know because the way people treat you and then your heightened sense of worry your heightened sense of um your sensibilities are just yeah. much more heightened yeah. and so you you get hyper hypercritical yourself sometimes women are not great bosses yes. and yet they are the most caring compassionate people you can find so there's a lot of dichotomy yes. so long winded way of saying my hope and prayer is like that we are able to really give women the tools to be their best selves and to really get rid of this conversation easier said than done yes. my journey's taken me years and years to get yes. there but once you are able to reach that spot and that requires an integrated holistic way of creating tools and techniques when we are trying to be it all yes. and do it all yes. and be that super mom super wife super yes. executive super friend yes. super community leader super socialite or whatever it is you're trying yes. to be we but we want to be multidimensional and shine and all and we think we are failures if we don't do that yes. i think we need to stop all that and it's easier said than done we can't do it and and i think that requires a complete retraining of the mind getting rid of a lot of the the negative stigmas that exist walking away from it which is easier that said than done so that to me is the journey i'd like to see women in particular go on it's true of a lot of people who are disadvantaged yes whether it's first generation people that come from disadvantaged beginnings yes they have more of this conversation in their head yeah. you uh, head your family foundation and also have made personal gifts uh, to a number of institutions both here and abroad one of your largest gifts was of course to the nyu tandon school of engineering why are you so passionate about investing in stem education and technology and how do you know when you have made a difference 20 years ago did you use email yeah 20 years ago did you have a cell phone 20 years ago 10 years ago yes. belly yeah 10 year, now can yeah. you do you have your cell phone somewhere nearby yeah. i mean you and can't live do you, you can't live without it yeah. i mean a lot of us yeah. wear fitbits yes. and and if you look ahead in terms of what's happening yeah. the whole space of technology is not something that's on the sidelines 20 years ago when we talked about thought about technology we thought about those guys at IBM or somewhere else yeah. that were doing coding work yeah. or yeah. some of us had learned programming yeah. languages yeah. it was yeah. the chief technology officer in a company yeah. Yeah. and now, the fax machine was so revolutionary yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah. now it is so integrated yes. into businesses 
into society, yeah. into everything. Into your life, yeah. And, and, and what's going to happen? Yeah. And now sitting with, the, with some of the greatest minds yeah. in, in the engineering school, the, the potential of what is happening in technology, whether it's in the space of wearables, whether it's in the space of what is going to happen in, in the fields of health and the fields of um, urban, just the whole urban informatics, what's going to happen is mind-boggling. So technology is not something that is just sort of on the sidelines that one can sort of look at and say, oh, you know, I'm an artist. Yeah. I'm The field of the arts is yes. transformed. Yes. The field of health is transformed. Yeah. And yeah. we ain't seen nothing yet. Yes. You know, it's just beginning. Yeah. So that having been said, can you imagine a whole generation of people that grow up not knowing much about it? Yes. If they walk into work, a whole, the, so we have this this dichotomy. We have an entire society that's changing. Businesses are changing, yes, yeah. and and not and at changing. Such a rapid pace. Exactly, yeah. they're not changing at a snail's yeah. pace. So you've got that happening, yeah. and we've got to create this group of students and kids that come out yeah. who are adept. We don't really want to produce kids mm -hmm. that understand the current technology because that's going to be outdated. Yeah. We want people that have the critical thinking. Yeah and to be able to think about what is society and how can I use all the te tools and techniques available to me and technological solutions to solve the problems of society, to make society better. The only place we felt we could do this was through the engineering school. Yeah. So, and again, years ago, engineering was mechanical, civil, civil and so on. Now yeah, yeah. it really is a way that different technological disciplines yeah. can come together in very unique ways to solve the problem of society. So the whole field of bioengineering, which didn't exist yeah. several years ago, yeah. we're now looking at how do you create devices for stroke victims? How do you create different ways that a surgeon can operate? Yeah. Or And the whole field of AI, which yeah. is transforming yeah. so much that's happening, which is creating brand new spaces in terms of how technology yeah. can come out. Yeah. I mean, and all these big companies that were retailers and so on yeah. that didn't whether it's uber or amazon or what they're all technological companies that have yes. that have evolved yeah. and the financial services industry yeah. is a different technological bank yeah. so our dream so the reason we invested yeah. in the engineering school yeah. was around that that technology is such a central part and we would it's a large school and the fact that we can equip so many students yeah. to be participating in the world yeah. was a very and exciting idea. And where they have all the resources. It was a very yeah. exciting yeah. idea. And yeah. the second and third thing yeah. is that one of the most exciting things about this school relative to the rest of NYU, which I've been involved in on the board and, yeah. and the different schools of NYU yeah. for several years, for yeah. 20 years almost, yeah. 18 years, it's that we have a very high proportion of first-generation students, yeah. first in their family, yeah. to go to college. Yeah. And... Now, by the way, the entering class is 47% women. Yeah. So can you imagine the potential? And by the way, when they graduate, yeah. they get some of the second or the third highest salary yeah. in all of the New York area. Yes. So think of this potential that yes. you're, you're a first of the family, family to go to college. Yes. You have now yeah. had a four-year, fantastic four-year education. Yes. And at the end of it, you get a great job. Yeah. And you then, what are you going to be focused on? You're going to be focused on education. And so generations are going to change. You often talk about and refer to your mantra of love, light, <laughs> and laughter. Why are these three words so important to you? And how does this connect uh, with the with the well-being initiatives you are so passionate about now, uh, and uh, you have been spearheading, particularly with young people. So, this is a this is a really interesting point about love, light, laughter. You know, yeah. when I started on my journey towards myself, um, I said to myself, "What I really want is every day to be filled with joy, love." light, just feel, I didn't want to feel burdened. I yeah. wanted to feel light. And I just wanted to feel this laughter. So it was, you know, um, it was an acronym and, and I started to use it. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, every time I wrote this down, I kind of made it a signature. This is about 15, 12, 15 years ago. Yeah. For me, yeah. I started to use it because every single moment, I want to remind myself yeah. that that's the place I want to be in. Yeah. We're human beings. Yes. I have really bad days. Yeah. But what used to be a bad day before yeah. is now a bad hour. Yeah. You don't make it the whole I don't, day. It's, yeah. it's just yeah. everything is just 
just washes away. Yes. We are we are all living in the in the world. Yeah. And the vicissitudes of life, life goes up, it goes down. Yeah. You know, we don't always have happy lives. Things yeah. go all right. Yeah, oh bloody, but, oh bloody. Oh bloody. <laughs> That's, yeah, I love yeah, my yeah, favorite yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. But but what it, I think this love, light, laughter, and the processes, by the way, this is not yeah. just an empty term because yeah. I practice a lot of processes from meditation and breath work to stay in that place because it's not, it's like brushing your mind. Yeah. We all brush, if you don't yeah. brush your teeth, yeah. And you go out, yeah. everyone knows you smell bad. Yeah. But it's the same thing when you don't brush your mind and yeah. you go out, you are carrying all this negative energy yes. because yes. you're out there communicating yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. But when you don't brush your mind yeah. with this practice, yeah. you are just, you don't know you're carrying it. All you know is you feel this heaviness. Yes. So I wanted to really make this a mantra. So yeah. that was why I made that. Now, when I've experienced such a gift from it, yeah. why would you not want to share it? Yes. This is not somebody who's declaiming from a mountaintop. Yeah. I am yeah. I haven't given up anything. Yes. I'm in and of the world. Yeah. I'm I'm working funnily enough, I worked really hard, as I said, 24-7. Yes. But I am now at 65 working three times as hard as I did. I have many more initiatives. And for some reason, I'm not tired. Yes. I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so yeah. excited because yeah. everything is yes very purposeful yes. and they talk you know in meditation sometimes they yeah. talk of mindfully yes. consciously, consciously yes. living yes. and i really think this whole well-being initiative that you mentioned yeah. is i just want everyone yeah. to be in that space to be in a conscious happy love light laughter space uh, you have shared your spiritual journey in part uh, through your music, as uh, we've spoken about your passion, etc. And I was among the hundreds uh, who were mesmerized uh, by your performance at the Kennedy Center uh, in November 2009, your Shivoham. Thank you uh, for being there. Yo, it was, uh, the whole family was there and they were just mesmerized and kept talking all the way back home. What is the connection between spirituality and music for you? And what is your next phase in your musical journey? Music, for me, basically helped me and gave me a path to resolve my crisis of spirit. Because to really be a good musician, particularly when I started going into Indian music at the highest levels of Indian music, you need to quiet the mind. You can't find your note until your mind is quiet. Or if you're constantly worrying about how you're going to sound, yeah. you are not going to even be a good performer because you can't create. In fact, um, there's a very beautiful Hindi, um, it's a Kabir Doha, yeah. and it says, Jab main tha, tab hari nahi. Ab hari hai, main nahi. It says, when I was playing in that, then there was no divine. And now the divine took over and I'm no longer there. So you have to let go yeah. and just let let go and let in. Yeah. So you have to let in that greater part because it's and so and I think this was my spiritual journey, and a lot of tools helped me, but the music was a big part of it. And the Kennedy Center of Shivoham was a way for me to express that journey in an oratorio. So I basically wrote that set of music, yeah. which just talked about how I searched this whole epiphany, the crisis I had, what I did about did to do this, and how it's changed my life how I now no longer just want to be happy yeah. myself. Yeah. I really want yeah. not just peace for the world, I want blessings for the world. Yes. And that's a very different way to think about, I really want to do good to the planet. When I measure my impact in the world, it would really be, did I use everything I had in my best self to do good? And now I'll, I continue to do music, I continue. It's, it's Now it's just a matter of time because we are, we are all, it's a matter of creating priorities and yeah. being a world-class musician, a performing musician, means you have to do endless hours of practice. Yes. And that takes away time. Yeah. And, and on the other hand, I'm very active in the STEM world and in the education space, yeah. and I still have a business to run. Yeah. And that requires a lot of thought and because we are in the middle of transforming the engineering school. There, there are many demands. Yeah. Competing demands and all which which all which are exciting. Yeah. So I'm doing more music. Yeah. So it's a matter of just 
each day is yeah. is an adventure yeah uh, in addition to your music career uh, you are an ardent supporter of the arts what is the connection between arts and society today and why should we care about the arts you know this is really uh you you're touching on something which is very critical to society and particularly in a society where some of the conversation is really about looking at the arts as like dessert that you know it's dessert we can skip it so that's why very often when when funding programs are cut yeah. the first ones that are cut are, are, are the, arts. the arts because they say well they are optional yeah. but in fact arts are the lifeblood because what the arts do at different stages they do different things because you know i'll never forget uh, one of the teachers saying to a lot of young children who were in this in this singing group they were very young maybe 7 8 years old they were all singing ardently and you know the teacher looked at them all and said it's an old very wise teacher she said you kids will never be depressed because when things go down you'll just go back and sing yeah. you know and and i think so and i think a lot of the arts in the earlier years give kids a way to just become fuller bigger beings so i feel that we all have to come together to really help do we have to really rethink the role that arts play because arts is not about singing or dancing that's not what it's about all the different forms of arts are a great tool yeah. to help everybody find their best self yeah. well, i used to run a community choir yeah. i don't know if you know that yeah. but i used to have it was over 100 people older people that would come together every sunday for 2 hours it was just free of charge and i would just compose music and you won't believe this was the most important event in their lives it was the most important event in my life and then after scheduled reasons we couldn't continue it yeah. but i did it for about 4 years yeah you know i would get letters and, and the average age was somewhere between 70 and 80 years old yeah. this was a lot of them were indians most of them were indians yeah. actually from people would write to me you know who their, their daughters their daughters in law yeah. would write to me and say you have changed my mother in law ever since she started coming to the choir yeah. she's just so kind she's yes. so gentle yes. and you know that that says something and yeah. that's not a joke yeah. people were because i think what it does is it just creates this love light laughter it starts to open up these dimensions yeah. you know suddenly you're singing and dancing yeah. you can't not be joyous even if it's just for those 2 hours yeah. and then you're going back into your life yeah. you have just had a chance out yeah. and i think we need to give every person yeah. on the planet yeah. that job because it's very free easy to do yeah especially with technology yeah so that's the reason yeah. i'm i am a great supporter of the arts yeah. i mean i'm on the board of lincoln center and i'm very interested in exploring this whole issue of bringing in new audiences yeah. this is not about just white love yeah. people coming yeah. to the big big important events yeah. that we need that too because yes. the patrons and it's the patronage yeah. is very important yeah. but the the arts have a broader purpose yeah. and i think we need to talk about the arts in that context yeah. so and i feel that needs to happen yeah. it's happening but yeah. not nearly enough the ancient wisdom of uh, india south asia and uh, the fact that you are an exception where you've been able to synthesize the arts and stem subjects etc how do you bring that ancient wisdom and uh, bring it up in such a way that there is the appreciation of the arts and a love for the arts as well as go hand in hand in terms of the technology that's uh, evolving so fast today and the stem subjects which are so imperative uh, not just in terms of uh, academia it's it's so important in terms of the world we live in you're exactly right and i think it really goes back into rethinking each of our lives as being more than one dimension because if we start to think and and the labeling we put on ourselves is oh i'm just a great businesswoman yeah. i'm an artist yeah. and it's funny whenever anyone talks to me they say oh you're an artist yeah. i say yeah sometimes yeah. but i'm also an educator sometimes yeah. i'm part of being serving the world sometimes and i'm in the business world sometimes i think we all have those sometimes and we all have the capacity if we have the time the resources and the attention by the way none of this came easy to me yeah you know i didn't just like wake up in the yeah. morning and become Overnight. a musician yes you know i worked very hard to be a good musician yeah. so i don't know if you know but 
when I found a teacher yeah. to teach me, that the teacher that I found was in Wesleyan, two hours away from New York. I would leave home at 3.30 in the morning every Saturday. And I had a little baby yeah. who would only wake up at 11. So I begged the teacher to teach me from 6 to 8. So, so I would drive 3.30, 4 to 6, I would reach, I would reach yeah. Wesleyan. Yeah. It's exactly two hours, yeah. two hour, one hour, 50 minutes if I yeah. drove very fast. And Vishwa would teach me at 6 to 8 to our class. I'd sing the whole way there, sing the whole way back. And 8, 8, 10, I would stop for a muffin and I would leave and come back. And I would be home at 10, 15 and wake up my child. This was my routine every Saturday. And by the way, most times I'd have just arrived Friday night from a flight. And then I would practice because Vishwa couldn't care less what your schedule was. Yes. If he was going to take you as a student, yes. he was such a master, he wanted you to have practiced because he would say to me, you haven't practiced, why are you in the class? Yeah. Why are you? Why so I had to, mind, yeah. so I would practice, literally I would practice after I put, you know, in the middle of the night I'd be practicing. So I worked very hard for my music. I mean, yes, I'm lucky I've got, I've got the musical yeah. sense from the divine, which I didn't create, I had nothing to take. But I, what I will take credit for is I put in a lot of work. Yes. And I think this is the same true of the business world, and it's true of the world of anything I'm doing, whether it's STEM or working in the institutions. I spend so much time at NYU. So what Whatever we choose to do, whatever dimensions we choose to explore, we have to invest in it. And I think our, our whole diaspora is just one of the most talented diaspora in the planet. Yeah. Most of us came here very educated. Yeah. They're whip smart. If you asked me, if I would reframe your question to say, what do I tell my diaspora friends? Because just again, based on my own experience, when I came here, like a lot of us, I was just working to send money back to India. When we gave the gift to NYU, I must have got thousands of mails from people saying, why would you want to give yes. here when there's poor people in India? Yeah. And by the way, the first several years of my life, that's all we did. We, I was engaged in the temples. I was engaged yeah. in yeah. giving back in India. Yeah. You know, Helping families back there. And, you know, know, I can't tell you how many schools, yeah. how many livelihood programs yeah. I've supported, yeah. temples I've supported. Yeah. We've done that. Yeah. But then at some point, as part of this thing, I decided we need to engage in the country that has given us yes. everything. Yeah. And there is no difference yeah. between the society here. I know I came from this town yeah. in Chennai, yeah. but this is my town. Yeah. This is my people. Yeah. So And you're part of this community. Yes. I'm part yeah. of and this yeah. and you know, so to me, yeah. making a difference to the first generation yes. kid yeah. from the Bronx or from Brooklyn yeah. is as or more important now. Yeah than it was. So to me, the engagement, and that's why to me, Lincoln Center, I mean, the hundreds of organizations I'm involved with, yeah. which are non-diaspora. Yeah. Some are diaspora yes. and some aren't. Yeah. So I think we really do need to, as a community, yeah. start to view ourselves a little differently, yeah. where we are not just yeah. about enriching ourselves yes. as a community, which yeah. we need to do, yes. but it's about integrating and enriching yeah. everybody an around in us. integral part of the mainstream, yeah. And, and yeah. by serving. Yes. We don't have to do it yeah. just by, by, for social yes. good. It is, and, but that requires a very big mental change because, yeah. and I know the amount of criticism yeah. um, I received yeah. and we received um, for, for doing it. Yeah. But, and, but, but I think um, that, that I don't even see a, a person as a person as a person. I don't see color, I don't see yeah. boundaries. And I think one's vision has to be very, very integrated. This yeah. is my home. This is my country. Yeah. This is, I'm American. Yeah. I'm, I'm from an Indian origin. Yeah. And I, so I just think this integration into the society yeah. is a critical issue for all of us. Yeah. I have got to throw a fun question, you know, and uh, be a little more curious. You've shared your story so generously with our viewers. Uh, what is something surprising people might not know about you? Well... If I have time, I love to watch, binge watch a show. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, I pick the most trashy shows to binge watch. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. I don't have, I, the problem is I record all these shows. Yeah. And, you know, like I want to say Real Housewives or something. Yeah. But then the problem is yeah. I, suddenly yeah. I've, I've accumulated so many so episodes much, uh, that I can't that, watch them yeah, yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. So I, and That's then you like lose interest. A junk, yeah. But my yeah. surprising fact is that yeah. I sometimes used to have this childhood idea that yeah. I could, I would do the same thing with books, books. where I could have a pile of yes. like maybe a hundred, like 
I'm, I'm going to call them just, just like yeah. simple, frivolous books yeah. on the one hand yeah. and a whole pile of yeah. South Indian sweets on the other side <laughs> and then just spend the next yeah. four days yeah. in bed reading and eating yeah. rubbish. This would be my, yeah. that's my dream, yeah. if my dream scenario. Yeah. But I haven't got to do it yet. Yeah. I will one day. Yeah. And uh, finally, uh, you are still engaged in so many endeavors. Uh, what motivates you to keep contributing and what do you wish your legacy to be? I don't know about my legacy and I don't really care. What I can do is I want to live every day with impact and do the most and best I can. If my life ended today, I would be very, I would have done exactly what I should do. I have no regrets. That is my uh, mission for myself. In terms of a message, if, if you had the opportunity to sort of give your mantra and a message, what would be your message? I would like to see every person on the planet live in a state of love, light, laughter. And I really believe that being in that space would really help you realize your best self. And then you can create um, caring, conscious communities. Because once you're in that space, you cannot but want to do great things for the world. So as, as uh, Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see. And that's what I would like. Love, light, laughter. Thank you very much, Chandrika. <laughs> what an absolute pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You. Yes. Great question. Thank and you. Thank you very much uh, for watching. And till the next time, thank you.